Will there be lasting peace in Sudan? Rebel groups and the transitional government sign a deal to end two decades of conflict in Darfur and two states in the south. But what happens to the hundreds of thousands of Sudanese forced from their homes? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. It's being called a new beginning for Sudan. After nearly 20 years of conflict, the transitional government and the rebels have agreed to end fighting in the Darfur region, as well as states of the South Kordofan and the Blue Nile. Neighbouring South Sudan helped negotiate the peace agreement over the past year, but at least two armed groups refused to sign the deal. And previous accords in 2006 and 2011 failed to end the killings. Under the latest agreement, rebels will be given seats in Sudan's transitional government. Local regions will be given more power. Former fighters will be integrated into the Sudanese army. And the Sudanese, forced from their homes by fighting, have been promised compensation. The deal we signed today is a commitment from us and the armed groups that signed it to the Sudanese people who have suffered from the consequences of war, such as destruction, displacement, and they're looking for stability and better living. It's also a commitment to get through the crucial times the country is currently going through. The country is facing times which need real commitment to the post-revolution needs, and we hope Sudan and its people reap the benefits of real change that will end their suffering. By achieving such an agreement that addresses the root causes and the consequences of conflict in Sudan, Sudan has finally achieved the possibility of durable peace and can move forward in undertaking a comprehensive and genuine political transition for the benefit of all Sudan. Rebels in the western region of Darfur started fighting government forces 17 years ago. They mostly belong to minority groups which complain about political and economic marginalization by Sudan's Arab-dominated leadership. Fighting has killed more than 300,000 people and forced almost 3 million from their homes. Thousands more have died in the southern states of South Kordofan and Blue Nile since the fighting started there nine years ago. Former President Omar al-Bashir sent the notorious militia called the Rapid Support Forces to crush the unrest. After his overthrow last year, Bashir was indicted by the International Criminal Court for war crimes and genocide. Several factions declared a truce and joined negotiation with the new government after Bashir was ousted. Our guests are all in the United States. In Washington, D.C., Jamila Ahmed, a legislative aide and member of the Sudan Task Force in Somerville, Massachusetts. Alex Duval, he's the executive director of the World Peace Foundation and a former member of the African Union mediation team for Darfur. And also in the U.S. Capitol, Cameron Hudson, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He's a former chief of staff in the office of the U.S. Special Envoy to Sudan. A welcome to you all. I'd like to begin in D.C. with you, Jamila Ahmed. What a year it's been for Sudan. A revolution, a transitional government, Omar al-Bashir inching closer to a war crimes um, trial, and now this historic peace deal between the transitional government and the rebels. How difficult was this to get to, this deal to get to? Oh, what a wonderful question, uh, you know, Imran. Honestly, it's been a tumultuous year. It's been a painful year. Uh, last year, we saw millions of people uh, forge into the streets, demanding freedom, peace, and justice, asking for the ouster of former President Omar al-Bashir. Um, they achieved that. The Sudanese people achieved that. But we quickly watched that process um, really become inundated with political pressures um, and also instability from factors that were competing uh, for Bashir's spot. Um, it's been challenging recently, um, given the violence in Darfur just last month, over the last several months. It's also been very vi uh, difficult with the coronavirus pandemic in Sudan. As you uh, probably know, Sudan does not have the infrastructure that it needs, the health infrastructure, to really deal with this type of crisis. Amid all of that, we're 
dealing with an economic, uh, quite a lot of economic instability, and we continue to deal with economic instability. Most recently, um, there's been flooding across Sudan, but the people of Sudan are determined. They want democracy. They want freedom, peace, and justice. Uh, folks died for that last year to try to make that happen, um, and we're going to continue fighting for um, what we envision for the future of Sudan. Uh, also in Washington, D.C., I want to bring Cameron Hudson here. You were the uh, special envoy uh, to Sudan. You worked clearly on the Darfur file. Uh, were you surprised when this announcement was made, or is this something that you did expect after the transitional government came in? Well, this was clearly one of the top priorities of the transitional government. It's written into the constitutional declaration of the country that they deliver peace uh, to the marginalized regions of Sudan. So, no, I'm not surprised. Um, that they've signed this agreement. I think that when you look at who signed the agreement, though, what you'll see is uh, the people who have signed this agreement have signed previous peace agreements uh, with the government, both the previous government and now this government, right? So uh, there are a number of notable holdouts to this peace agreement. And so I don't think you're going to have a, a full and comprehensive peace, as the as the transitional government is now calling it, until you have some of these um, uh, armed factions who have not signed this or previous agreements to sign on to the peace. And that's going to take a lot more work, I think. Uh, Alex Duvall, uh, Cameron Hudson makes an interesting point. There were peace deals in 2006 and 2011 uh, that failed. What makes this one, what makes this one different? This one is different because it's a, a deal signed with a, a government that has a credible aspiration to move to democracy so that this, this government can offer something that the uh, al-Bashir regime couldn't, which is a, a truly credible, popularly backed commitment to a, a constitutional transformation. That said, it faces some very formidable problems. It is a cohabitation between a civilian leadership and a military leadership, and the military leadership is not only extremely powerful, but also has its hands on key aspects of the economy. And the economy is at the moment in, in free fall. And unless that is halted, then many of the aspirations of the people and many of the promises of this peace deal simply cannot be delivered. But Jamila, if these two groups haven't signed on to this peace deal, does it make it that much different from previous peace deals? Will it fail? Is it set up to fail? Um, you know, I, I'm more focused on, as Cameron said, the people who did sign the peace deal. Um, as, as Cameron said, um, they were a part of the of the previous peace deals that we saw, um, you know, under the Bashir regime. There are some unsavory elements, some factors um, who belong to the Bashir regime um, still in power. And I must say, looking at the images coming out of Sudan yesterday, um, I was excited, I guess you could say, about the fact that we did sign this peace deal because the people of Darfur deserve peace. Uh, the people of Dar Darfur deserve to be able to live in their homes and not fear um, the threat of a force coming in from outside um, and, and, and impacting their stability. But the individuals who signed on to this peace deal um, throughout history, through that, throughout Sudan's history, um, have been some of the worst perpetuators of this violence that we've seen in Darfur. And I do believe, uh, to move forward, that the people who need to be uh, most serious about making sure sure um, that this, this process doesn't become um, unstable, that they need to be sure that they're confident in their own abilities uh, to make sure that they uh, uphold the agreements that they've signed on to. Uh, Jamila, are you confident that they are, that they can do it? Um, in all honesty, I, I want to believe, and it's very emotional for me to, uh, to answer that question, given the totality of the violence that Hameti and Burhan have, uh, you know, cast across the entire country um, since, you know, they, they came into power. And, and I'd like to say that I'm, I, uh, I'd like to be um, confident, but I'm not sure at this time. Um, how confident I am. Just last month, we continued to watch violence perpetuated against the people of Darfur, which truly poses a threat um, to the overall stability of our revolution. This was the first time, really, in Sudan's history that we saw everyone come together, um, despite their religious differences, despite their tribal differences, 
Um, and to see this violence again threatening the people of Darfur, um, it's really it's really affected the people on the ground and their belief in this revolution and a united Sudan. Um, so so I, I don't know. I'd like to say that I'm 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 hopeful, um, but but I'm I'm not sure. Um, that that Hameti and Burhan should even be in our government, let alone um, should be leading a peace process. It's good that they're witnessing it and they're a part of it, um, but I, I would like to see uh, true transparency and I would like to see uh, the violence come to an end. It will be very easy to tell quickly um, if, if this is successful or not. Hameti and Burhan are in the government. That's a fact that we can't um, really get away from. Alex Duval, there are two uh, international players here that have kept perhaps those two people in power. That's the UAE and Saudi Arabia. What's their role in all of this? Well, we have uh, a number of Middle Eastern actors who, in predominantly the UAE, Saudi Arabia. We also have Egypt and behind the scenes, or not so behind the scenes recently, Israel. And all of these have their own particular interests in Sudan, and none of them, unfortunately, have an identifiable uh, interest in democracy. They are sponsoring their own um, favored intermediaries um, who tend to be uh, the generals or, or, and, and the paramilitaries. They are people who are ready to serve the uh, security and economic and other political interests of the, the wider Middle East um, players. The, and, and behind this we have the United States because one of the key things that is holding back the revolution from achieving its goals of transformation is this economic crisis and there is no prospect of the economic crisis being halted while the uh, state sponsor of terror designation remains in place on Sudan. That is an enormous dampener on the type of financial and economic normalization that is absolutely essential um, for Sudan to, um, to stabilize. Uh, Cameron Hudson, it's labyrinthian to say the least. You have a key US ally backing um, the government and actually probably not looking for uh, democracy within uh, Sudan itself, and that's Saudi Arabia. Is there any pressure the US can put on Saudi Arabia to move forward with this democratic process or is it game over when it comes to that? Well, no, I think the, the United States has been using a lot of the diplomatic leverage that it has to create the time and the space politically in Sudan for this transition to take hold um, and for it to mature and develop. And so I think you've seen um, the UAE, Saudi Arabia take a bit of a hands-off approach in the last few months. Um, and it has allowed, I think, the transitional government to uh, to continue to work through its growing pains. Uh, you know, we have to remember that this is an unprecedented agreement uh, that they're living through right now. And uh, as the prime minister, Hamdok, continues to hold it up as a potential model for the Arab world. And so I think the U.S. has been very involved diplomatically behind the scenes um, to, to, to keep those sort of negative outside forces at bay. Um, we've seen, obviously, now uh, the U.S. pushing, I think, Sudan into the arms of, of Israel. And I think it sees that as an opportunity, not just to bolster its own Middle East peace plan, um, but to test Sudan, because Sudan has said that it wants to reorient its foreign policy. It wants a balanced foreign policy. It wants to move away from the Saudi Arabia's, the UAE's, Iran. Um, it wants to move away from those past alliances and forge new alliances with democratic partners in the region and beyond. And I think they look at Israel as a perfect way to do both of those things. Jamila Ahmed, they're currently looking at Israel as a way of doing those things. But there's a lot of people in Sudan, a lot of ordinary people in Sudan, who simply don't want peace or even recognition of Israel. Is this going... Is Cameron right? Is this a big deal in Sudan, in, Sudan, in Sudanese talking circles? You know, you're asking me to, to tackle a lot there in terms of reconciling the way that uh, Sudanese, you know, in the homeland see it and, and the way that I might see it as, you know, a Sudanese living in the United States. I certainly say, uh, and I echo what Cameron said, I do think that it will benefit Sudan um, to have diplomatic and open relation uh, relationship with Israel. Um, but I do want to pivot back to, you know, what we were talking about before with UAE and um, Saudi Arabia. I do believe that the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia definitely need to, um, you know, 
do a little bit more in terms of encouraging, um, you know, Hamati and Burhan to do the right thing. I mean, it seems like, um, you know, after their meetings last year during the revolution, Hamati came back, um, you know, at least it seems, you know, a lot more prepared um, to assume more of a leadership position. And I do believe that came from financial backing from the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. And I, you know, give, considering the fact that, um, you know, these two countries are still um, engaged in, 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 in economic warfare with, with Qatar even, um, I do find their attempts at least to engage in a, a peace process when it comes to Sudan, a bit disingenuous if they can't even make uh, nice with their neighbors right across uh, the peninsula. But this is a peace agreement that it has actually happened now as part of it, uh, Jamila. Uh, the latest agreement, rebels will be given seats in Sudan's transitional government. Does that mean they get away with the crimes that they've perpetuated over the last 17 years? Is there a significant chunk of the Sudanese population that would rather have justice than this deal? Absolutely. Um, the Darfurian people have been robbed of justice um, for the past, since 2003, um, until Sudan decides to send uh, Omar al-Bashir to the International Criminal Court to begin with. The Sudanese people won't receive the justice that they deserve, um, and, and all of the Sudanese people, including um, people in South Sudan, who we have bloodshed on our hands uh, from creating instability there for, for, war, for wars. Um, for, for decades. And so, um, yes, I think that Omar al-Bashir needs to be sent to the International Criminal Court, but to follow behind, um, I, I believe that it, it is important as well um, for some of these, these, these elements that have seemed to survive the revolution um, to also face their day in court. Absolutely. Alex Duval, what do you think? Is this going to be the weak link in the, in the peace deal, the fact that some Sudanese people would rather see these people behind bars rather than within the government? I, I don't think it's the, the weak link in this peace deal. I think it was the weak link in the deal that was made a year ago, which allowed the military uh, leaders, uh, Khamenei, Burhan and others, to remain in a dominant position uh, in, in, in the government. I think giving an amnesty to the um, de facto amnesty to the armed rebels in Darfur and South Kordofan and Nuba Mountains is, 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 is frankly not an issue. I think those uh, armed groups need to be brought into government. I'm, I'm, it's a shame that this didn't happen a year ago, that this peace deal has, has, has taken so long. I think the real threat and here I have to disagree, uh, in, in particular with, with Cameron, is, is, is I think the prioritization by the uh, Middle Eastern powers, Egypt, uh, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates, and I put them all together, the prioritization of their immediate um, transactional security material interests over the preservation of democracy in Sudan. That is the threat. And the United States is falling into line with that. Essentially, what it has said to the civilian government is, don't call us in Washington, call um, Tel Aviv, call, call Cairo, call, call Abu Dhabi. They're the people who will sort this out for you. And if the United States had been committed, had been sincere about the success of democracy in Sudan, it would have found a way to stand up to the pressures coming from those those actors to favor their um, military intermediaries in Sudan. And it would have found a way to work around this enormous dead weight of the um, state sponsors of, of, of terror designation, which is no longer justified. Sudan has not been sponsoring terrorists for years and years. And the justifications are really um, procedural issues inside baseball within Washington. And if the administration had cared for democracy in Sudan, it would have had found a workaround for that. And it hasn't. And, 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 and I'm afraid that is the, the dead weight on the aspirations for uh, successful democracy and peaceful uh, change in, in, in Sudan. Cameron Hudson in Washington, D.C., your response, please. 
Well, listen, I mean, I think uh, Winston Churchill said it best that, best that Washington always does the right thing after it's exhausted all other options, right? And so I think it's taken a long time in Washington to um, to come to terms with this transitional government. I think we want to believe, people in Washington want to believe, but they've been slow to recognize that the durability um, and the genuineness of the transitional government is, is there, that the military isn't uh, simply waiting in the wings for this sanction to be removed, to then come in and overthrow uh, the civilian leadership, I think it's taken a little bit of time. Let's let's be clear: we have in in 30 years built up, I think, one of the most exhaustive sanction re regimes against Sudan. This transitional government just last week marked its one year in office. So we're talking about dismantling 30 years of bad blood, bad, bad relations, and a very complicated network of. Uh, executive office and congressional sanctions against this country. So it does take time. I don't want to uh, understate the uh, complexity of unwinding all of these uh, different uh, different sanctions. I think what we have seen from Secretary Pompeo in the last few months is a real effort to understand the Sudan situation, a real effort to reach out um, behind the scenes. He's had a number of phone calls uh, with the prime minister. He's made the first visit to Sudan in 15 years by a secretary of state. These should not be discounted. I completely agree, though, that I think it was a, it was a ham-handed approach uh, to push the Israel uh, piece of this. It ignored the sensitivities politically inside Sudan right now. The United States was trying to get something for nothing in Sudan. There's no question about that. But I do think that there's greater confidence now in Washington that the civilian-led transition can carry the day, can see this through to the end of the transitional period and hopefully to elections. So Cameron Hudson, it has to be actionable. There has to be something that the Americans give the Sudanese people. Alex Duval is suggesting that the state-sponsored terrorism designation be removed. It seems a simple enough thing to do, something that President Donald Trump could do quite easily. Why hasn't he done it? Well, I think they're working through it right now. Um, there is a political angle to this in Washington, which Alex suggested is a lot of inside baseball. But, um, you know, they're reckoning with uh, past misdeeds related to their designation. Um, so there have uh, been victims groups from the uh, U.S. Embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, which have come forward. There have been victim groups from the 9-11 terrorist attacks, which have come forward, which have cast a kind of political shadow over the delisting of Sudan right now. And it's it's really unfortunate, and it's it's political, it's greed-driven um, by potential victims in Washington. Um, and so it has to get sorted through. Uh, Congress is listening to these groups right now, and the administration really has to show some leadership and draw a line and say, this is in the not just the U.S. national security interest, which I believe it is, but it's in the interest of the transition that we delist Sudan. My sense is, is that Washington is very close uh, to getting to the point where it will delist Sudan. Uh, Jamil Ahmed, what do you think? Is Washington close to delisting Sudan, or do you disagree? Um, I echo everything that Cameron said. I do believe that Washington is close uh, to delisting Sudan from the state sponsor of terrorism list. Uh, but again, that can't come soon enough, as Alex uh, also highlighted, is the fact that it is the dead weight that's preventing Sudan from uh, being able to access uh, foreign direct investment, which will essentially be able to help but not completely um, erase or, or, or remedy uh, the entire situation on the ground in Sudan. That's going to take a lot uh, of work. But at the end of the day, um, Washington does need to make this decision. It is a political uh, game of baseball, uh, specifically. Um, you know, there are particular members of Congress that we are aware um, that have been lobbied heavily by victims groups. And so, you know, they 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 do believe that Sudan has to pay, um, you know, the, the debts of the family for some type, type of level of reconciliation uh, to move forward with that delisting. Unfortunately, when we, um, and I, and I don't say this to sound insensitive, when we weigh uh, the fact that we are holding up the futures of 44 million Sudanese people who are suffering, they're dealing with uh, a coronavirus pandemic on top of a coronavirus pandemic, they're dealing with flooding, uh, they're dealing with great deals of economic uh, instability. And at the end of the day, um, Washington needs to move forward today, as soon as possible. Alex Duvall, just very quickly, because we are running out of time, but the delisting may not happen uh, before November. Certainly after November, all bets are off. We don't know who's going to be in charge in the U.S. Are you confident that delisting might, ha might happen at all? 
Um, it really has to happen. I mean, the, the moral case for delisting um, is, is absolutely uh, waterproof. Um, and, and of course, if, if Sudan isn't delisted, it's not going to have the money to pay for any of this anyway. It seems to be entirely getting the, the cart before the horse to, to insist that uh, the, a, a democratic, uh, credible government do all these things to account for the sins of its predecessor before it gets any benefits from Washington, D.C. It's utterly absurd. I'd like to thank all our guests, Jamila Ahmed, Alex Deval, and Cameron Hudson. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.